sometimes think uh, we sing that song and when it comes to the assembly of the saints, we might ought to be singing when the roll is called down here, will I be there? <laughs> There's one thing for sure when that roll is called and each one comes to stand before the judgment bar of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, those that have absented themselves deliberately from the worship periods of the church and assemblies are not going to receive the kind of answer they claim they want to receive. And that's true of any of us who wear the name Christian but then live like those in the world. That ought to always be on our minds that we are living as the New Testament teaches Christians to live. That's what it is to be faithful to Christ. Today I would like to talk about another identifying mark of the Lord's Church we may not think about it as such, but it is. And that is that every member of the church prays to God. I think there are three things that weigh on my mind and have for more years than I can remember. Every day they weigh on my mind. And that is studying the Bible, prayer, and living out in my life what, Bible, what the Bible teaches when it comes to being a Christian. In reality, our praying to God tests our faith in God, which faith is formed by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. To address God as our Father and to petition Him with requests, even offering thanksgiving, praying for ourselves, our families, and others, the things will be done as God wants it to be, praying for strength to bear up under the burdens of life, to fight the fight of faith, to be faithful through all things, is really a great test of our faith in God. Because to pray like you ought to, there must be a disposition of mind that says, my God hears me, and as he said in his word, he will answer my prayers. We must have the disposition that God knows when to answer our prayers and how to answer our prayers better than we do. And I'm thankful for that because just as in many things, we would like this or that or the other or maybe certain things to cease. But they are not given to us because it's just not the best for us at that time. Now, parents actually should understand that when it comes to their children and the desires of children. Or even those things children do not think a thing about, but they need. So we are children of God. We're members of the Lord's church. We wear the name Christian, which means of Christ. So we need to address God knowing he has the ability to respond to our prayers and trust him based on his word that he will do so in the right manner. People talk about prayer all over the place. Every kind of person talks about prayer. I suppose an atheist, one who says there is no God, does not pray. He might, if it's from the standpoint of thinking it's a psychological outlet, something like that, to help him handle problems, but not really addressing a supreme being such as God and to expect a real answer. But everybody talks about prayer. I've made it a habit for a long, long time when I'm with my brethren to say, will you keep me in your prayers? I think it's a wonderful thing to know that your brothers and sisters in Christ are praying to our Heavenly Father on our behalf. A lot of people pray without realizing that God has established certain conditions for a person to meet in order for his prayers to be heard and answered. And that's a point that needs to be kept in mind. And the church, in being what the Lord's church is, the realm of the saved, the church is busy about teaching the whole counsel of God, a part of which pertains to prayer. And that's what we want to do some today. 
First of all, notice several scriptures that have to do with the church in the first century while the New Testament was being revealed and written did regarding prayer. In speaking of the 3,000 who had been added to the church, Luke, by inspiration, says, and they continued steadfastly, and he emphasized this for our point. We want to emphasize it at least. They continued steadfastly in prayers. More said in that verse, but our subject is prayers. And they continued steadfastly. They were regular in their going to God to pray. Then there was that company of Christians who, joined by Peter and John, had been greatly threatened by the Jewish council. Don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. Don't preach the gospel anymore. But in Acts 4, in verse 24, Luke tells us of them that under that threat, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Yesterday in our lectureship, which was well attended, we talked about the unity demanded by God. The unity of believers, of course, demanded by God. And we emphasize this business of doing things in one accord. That means unified of the same mind, of the same judgment, thinking and acting as the Lord teaches us so to do. We seek to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. That's the greatest challenge and goal there is in life, to know His will well enough that we bring our lives in subjection to Him by setting our affections on those things that pertain to spiritual matters and not of this present world. At the time that the 12, the apostles, were giving instruction to the men who served tables to take care of a problem in the early church, here is what they said to the multitude concerning their work that only they as apostles of Christ, ambassadors of the court of heaven to earth, could do. But we will continue steadfastly in prayer and in the ministry of the word. You remember that Herod put Peter in prison. And while he was in prison, notice that the church is doing this. Acts 12 and verse 5. Prayer was made earnestly of the church unto God for him. I will pause here and say, because of our fallible memories, there are a lot of people that need to be prayed for, for various reasons. If we can make notes to remind us in teaching the truth to others, if we can make in the mundane things of life a grocery list so we can remember what to pick up, if we can make all sorts of lists to aid our memory, then there's not a thing in the world wrong, but only right, to make lists, prayer lists, to guide us in praying for those things God expects us to pray to Him for. I suggest that be kept in mind. When you think, when you sit down and, well, just sit down and make that list, and you'll see how many things will come to mind that maybe when you're praying, you just don't think about them. Paul and Silas, as they spread the gospel, and because of their spreading the gospel, were put in jail in Philippi. And there at that midnight scene, they were praying and singing hymns unto God, Acts 16.25. We also notice that when Paul concluded his sermon to the Ephesian elders, that the scripture says he kneeled down and prayed with them all, Acts 20 and verse 36. We also read that all of the church at Tyre kneeled down on the beach and they prayed and bade Paul and his companion, companions farewell, Acts 21 and 4 and 5. But then we find teaching 
Now, just those examples, they teach, of course, too. There are patterns to look to, positive patterns to look to. But then we have outright instruction. The churches were admonished to pray. To the church in the city of Rome, Paul said, continuing steadfastly in prayer, Romans 12, 12. Really what these passages are saying when it says steadfastly in prayer is to be routine. Have a routine about praying. Some people have the idea that if you make a thing routine, then it takes away the significance and importance of it. Well, I don't think that's so. I involuntarily breathe pretty often, and that's pretty routine, and I, I'm glad I don't stop breathing. So that's kind of a fallacious argument. You do a lot of things routinely. You don't haphazardly do certain things. So continuing steadfastly in prayer means that you make it a practice to pray and to pray regularly as the Bible teaches. To the church in the city of Corinth, Paul told them in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 5 to give themselves to prayer. To the children of God in Ephesus, he said this to them. With all prayer and supplication, praying at all seasons in the Spirit, and watching thereunto in all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Ephesians 6 and verse 18. Now that covers a lot of things in that little verse. But it shows you the need for each one of us, if we're to be faithful and go to heaven, to be steadfast in our prayers. Yet we live in a world rushing around, rat race, and so many times the rats win, and all this kind of thing. We have to plan our days out when it comes to prayer. Now, there's nothing wrong with as you drive in Houston traffic to keep your eyes on the road and watch the people around about you, but in your mind praying to God to get home safely. Uh, David one time in striving to escape Saul was running up a hill and praying at the same time. But then there are those times when you go into the privacy of your room where you can pour your heart out to God and cover all sorts of matters. And that's one way of doing it. But we ought to always feel able to call on God, to ask Him for strength. Remember when Peter was walking on the water, the Lord was here in the flesh. He had bade the Lord who was walking on the water to allow him to come to him. And it was in a storm condition. Well, Peter, as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, walked on the water, but when he began to look around at all the turbulence, he began to sink. Now, I know we don't think of this much as a prayer, but what did he cry out and to whom did he address it? He simply said, Lord, save me. And that's very important to understand. Sometimes that's all you might be able to do. God help me. So to the church at Philippi, Paul penned in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto him. Philippians 4 and verse 6. Then to Christians... At Colossae, he said to them, continuing steadfastly in prayer, watching therein with thanksgiving. Colossians 4 and verse 2. To the church in Thessalonica, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. And notice, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus to you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. Now, I could just stop right here. And those of you interested in doing what God says, I think that's most of you, you would have the wherewithal to remind you, because you would already know these scriptures, and most do. But this would help stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance if I stopped here. And you might be more determined then to be as you ought to be as a child of God, a Christian, one who's of Christ, in praying to God. One thing this does in looking at these passages, it shows that the church of which we read about in the New Testament in the first century was a praying church. 
It trusted in God. I think you can see from these verses that they prayed as if everything depended on God. But yet when you look at their lives, they incorporated into their lives those actions the Bible authorized them to do with great zeal and fervency as if everything depended on them. Because there is cooperation. The gospel is God's power to save, Romans 1.16. Yet God has put the gospel into the charge of his church and said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's rather amazing to me that while God would have every man be saved and Christ died for all, yet he puts the gospel, his power to save, into the hands of those who are saved, the church. And that seems to me to imply that he expects us to love the lost souls of men as God loves the lost souls of men. And we know that we're instructed in various places to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And I don't know how you can love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and not do all you can to help your brother or sister to walk the straight and narrow way of divine truth because there is no other way to heaven. Our Lord, the founder of the church, prayed much, and he was God in the flesh. As much man as we are humans, and as much God as God is deity. At the beginning of his public ministry, immediately following his being baptized, the scripture records that he prayed, Luke 3 and verse 21. On the evening before he selected the twelve, he went out into the mountains to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God, Luke 6, 12. Now, I want you to think about this. And all night long as he prayed to his heavenly Father, he was not praying, forgive me of sins, for he had no sin. Then what was he praying for? I can only conclude that he was praying to be strengthened to continue to keep the truth of God that no man ever had done. Because he overcame sin as a man. He put himself in the position to be tempted to sin when he became a man. Thus, to find the strength that he needed because he never sinned. He prayed to God for that strength. We know too from John 17, he prayed for others. How much of that prayer that night was praying for his disciples, for his apostles, for him to accomplish what God sent him to do? Remember, he made the statement one time, I do always those things that please my Father. That's a statement and a half. But that should be our goal. That should be the only thought in our mind. I do always those things that please him. If we could just keep in mind that everything we experience through our five senses is going to be gone someday. The universe, the solar system, all the stars, all the planets. Everything that we can experience right where we are today through our five senses are going to be gone and they'll never be again. That what we do in this life is to prove to God we love Him supremely and that we have faith in him and his system of salvation. So much so that we keep his commandments. That's something to pray about. That's something to go to your heavenly father in prayer and say, help me to keep this before my eyes. Help me to help others as the Bible defines that help. Notice too in Luke 5, 16, that he withdrew himself in the desert and prayed. I said earlier that we can pray anytime, but here's where he chose to go by himself, where he would not be bothered, as he was so deep in prayer. At the conclusion of our Lord's parting message to his disciples, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and prayed. And I referenced John 17 a moment ago. Shortly before the trying ordeal of, and that's putting it mildly, his arrest by the cruel mob and 
terrible, excruciating torments that he went through. The scripture has him praying intently and fervently. So much so that he is so feverishly involved in that prayer that great sweat drops fell from him. Have you ever prayed like that? It shows you that in keeping his human self in complete, perfect subjection to God to do what only he could do to save us from our sins, he poured out his heart to his God. While he was dying upon the cross, he prayed, Luke 23, 34 through 46. I think it's interesting that part of his praying on the cross had to do with others. It's important to realize that he was taking note of that thief that was penitent, came to his senses and asked to be remembered when he came to his kingdom. And he responded to him. Then he simply announced, because nobody took his life from him, he laid it down, that at the end of those six hours, he commended his life to God. That is his spirit. He speaks to the Father. And he commends his spirit to the Father. He willed himself to die. I often think that he suffered to the uttermost to satisfy the justice of a pure, perfect God to save us from our sins. For he had no sin. Thus, that causes us to realize that everything he did on this earth was for you and for me and everybody else. Especially his death on the cross. No wonder then that we have as an act of worship on the first day of the week in the assembly of the saints the Lord's Supper to observe. We chose forth his death till he come again. Now there are a lot of religious bodies that have emphasized the importance of prayer. But again I say they haven't consulted what God had to say about praying. We must understand that you can pray to God and yet he won't hear your prayer. James wrote to Christians. It's a part of the New Testament. And he said, Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss. And he shows us their mind was in the wrong place. That ye may spend it on your pleasures. James 4, 3. So there are certain things as to our motives, our reason for praying, our purpose. We must be right. We can't be wrong. I know that. If from nowhere else, this scripture. And these are members of the church. Well, do you think then if they made that mistake, that today people won't make the same mistake? Not all who pray then are heard, but all who would be heard would be heard if there were no conditions. Well, what are those conditions? Well, I could sum it up by saying you must be faithful to God in the way the Bible defines being faithful to God. It means that we must be righteous, for the scripture says, For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears under their supplication. 1 Peter 3 and verse 12. That means we keep the commandments of God. We do only what's authorized by Christ in the words of the New Testament. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Then he gives you a reason. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. 1 John 3, 22. It's not going to do any good for a liar or a thief or a fornicator or an adulterer or a covetous person who lives those ways to pray to God for strength and to pray to God for a better life. Prayer will not take the place of your repentance. Any more than baptism will replace repentance. Or will replace confession of faith in Christ. Or will replace belief in Christ. So we must know we must live the right kind of life if we're to pray 
as we ought to pray. And notice this, but let him ask in faith, nothing doubting, for he that doubteth is like the surge of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Again, that's James writing to Christians in James 1, verses 6 and 7. We must have our minds right, as the Bible defines right. We must have our lives right, as the Bible defines right. We must believe in God and believe that He will give what He has promised to give. We must trust that He will give as we need, and He knows better how to give it than we do. And He knows what we need better than we do. If we ask for things God's never promised to give, then we cannot be asking by faith. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. We're to pray by the authority of Jesus. That means in Jesus' name. When Jesus was speaking to the apostles about his going back to heaven and the Holy Spirit coming to be with them, to enable them to do what he called them to do as apostles, we read this, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, that will I do. I want to remind you again, this is a statement Jesus said to the apostles regarding their work. It's not said to all of us. We can't get together and say, well, let's all agree that this is what God wants, and then we'll, we'll pray and he'll get it done. No, that's not what's being said. Jesus is saying, if you're going to be what I called you to be, which is peculiar to your apostles, then this is the way it works. But nevertheless, it shows that we're to pray in Jesus' name. We're to pray in Jesus' authority. The apostles were to abide by his authority. In fact, we quote this often to show the proof of love in your life and my life is to keep his commandments, but that was made to the apostles originally. If you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 50. Again, we are to pray, though we've touched on this already, in complete harmony with the will of Christ. And this is the boldness which we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. 1 John 5, verse 14. I think that sometimes that we are cautious in our prayers to say, not my will, but thy be done. We must have a forgiving spirit. Now, we can't forgive somebody that God won't forgive. And if they're to be forgiven, there are certain conditions they must meet. If you're not a Christian, they've got to obey the gospel from the heart, that their sins will be washed away in baptism and reconciled to God. We must understand, too, that when a person is a member of the church, we can't forgive somebody when they're in sin and won't repent of it. God certainly doesn't. But there must be the disposition cultivated and made keen in our lives that is ready to forgive, that we want to forgive. Don't you know that's God's attitude? God wants to forgive everybody of their sins. Proof of that is just Christ coming to this earth and doing what the Bible says he did. But God won't forgive them if they will not comply with the conditions of salvation. And so it is with us. We must be wanting to forgive, cultivating the spirit of forgiveness, ready to forgive when people do meet those conditions of forgiveness. But if you give not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew 6, 15. We must then be in what we would call the proper scriptural, spiritual condition. If you abide in me, that's effort on my part to abide in Christ as he teaches me to abide in him. And my words abide in you, which shows then we're following his word. If you ask, or if you ask whatsoever you will, and it shall be done unto you, John 15, 7. Again, to the apostles pertaining to their work. But the sentiment is the same when it comes to your being faithful today as a Christian, a member of the Lord's church. Our hearts must be receptacles of Christ's word for our prayers to be answered. There's no use praying all these flowery prayers 
when we don't intend to do certain things in our life that God demands that we do to be faithful. We must have then the right motive of mind. Remember what James said? You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures, James 4, 3. Prayers that are the outgrowth of wrong motives aren't going to be heard. I remember one time that the late Guy Woods in long years ago, because he didn't do local work in his early part of his life, but Brother G.K. Wallace was in a meeting with him. And a woman responded to the invitation. And when they listened to what she said, she was responding on behalf of somebody else to confess that other woman's sins. Well, somebody sure was ignorant of something for whatever reason. Are we to pray for sinners? Not that they be forgiven in their sins and not that they be forgiven when they will not do what God requires of them to be saved. We may well pray for them that they develop a heart that will be receptive to the word. Well, I even pray for myself that whatever it takes to bring me in harmony with God's will where I'm, I'm lacking, let it happen to me. I almost shake when I say that <laughs> because I don't know what may come upon me. But the point is, I want to go to heaven. And this world is fleeting very quickly by. And you know, I used to say those very words when I was 20 years old, buddy. And it's gone by rather rapidly here at 73. But I preached it then with the same thought of mind that I preach it now. How did I know I'd ever see 25 or 30 or 40 or 50? I didn't. And a whole host of folks between when I was 20 and where I am now didn't. So we live every day as if it's our last. Thus, we ought to be praying in the same way. You remember even Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34, when it came to crucifying him. And you know they would be when on the day of Pentecost, the gospel was preached and they were pricked in their heart. When they were told, you crucified son of God, you put him to death. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And as believers, he told them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And those that did so, Acts 2.41, received the answer of the Lord's prayer. So Jesus taught us to pray for sinners. But I say unto you, love your enemies and pray for them that persecute you, Matthew 5.44. You have brethren that are like Ananias and Sapphira, you have brethren that will not submit to God's will. They're troublemakers in the church. They've always been here and they always will be. Are we praying for them that they come to their senses and repent of their sins? And then are we doing what we need to to cause them to see it? They may never do it, but I sure pray for them. That they do come to their senses, that they do see their sins, that they will humble themselves and obey the truth and be forgiven. So in that sense, it's scriptural to pray for sinners. We must understand then that prayer has its place, but it doesn't take the place of the plan of salvation. You can pray to be forgiven of God and ask God to come into your life and save you. And he's not going to do it if you're an alien sinner, one who's never become a Christian. There is no such thing taught in the New Testament as the denominational people use it, the sinner's prayer. It's not there. That's a figment of their fertile imagination. You must receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Believe the plan of salvation and submit yourself to it. And out of faith and your love of God, and your compliance with the conditions of salvation, believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins, God will forgive you. All sins, no matter who else they involve, are ultimately against God. 
Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. It separates from God. Nothing else will separate you from God. Sin is the greatest enemy you have. It needs to be forgiven that you can be reconciled to God, justified in His sight. You need to stand before Him covered by the blood of the Lamb. But there are conditions to meet. Just to pray and say, God, forgive me for Christ's sake, won't do it. Well, why won't it? Well, you just pick up the last will and testament of Christ. Read every word in it, and you'll see why it won't. Because it is not taught by Christ, but the plan of salvation is. As a child of God, when you sin, then you must see that sin. You must recognize it for what it is, and you must repent of it. Confessing those sins, praying God for forgiveness. I often say that's God's second law of pardon for the child of God. Thus, there's this disposition always to be praying to God. Praying to God according to His will. Addressing our prayers according to the model prayer to our Father. And trusting that God, as we live righteous lives, will answer our prayers. For the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. How much is much? It's more than a little. But you must pray the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. And all of God's commandments are righteousness. That's how you're righteous, is to obey from the heart the truth. Psalm 119, verse 172, and Romans 6, 17, and 18. So as we see the importance of prayer, then we need to know that God's people have a mark that they are God's people. One of those marks is prayer practiced the way the New Testament teaches that it be practiced. Now, if you need to obey the gospel, we just finished studying the plan of salvation, how you become a Christian. Or as a child of God, if you need to repent of sins, then we've studied about that. But, you know, you can pray for forgiveness of sins, but if you haven't repented of them, they won't be forgiven. So even in God's second law of pardon, repentance is so important before prayer is ever offered to God for forgiveness. If you're subject to the Lord's blessed invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.